Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Offbit. Today we paired a GT430 with a Core 2 Duo E8400. My question is, can you still game in 2020 with a GT430 paired with a Core 2 Duo? Stick around and find out. This is the Core 2 Duo E8400. The Core 2 Duo was officially added to Intel's lineup on July 27, 2006. The Core 2 Duo replaced the Pentium 4 and the Pentium D. The Core 2 Duo has a more simpler design in architecture opposed to the Pentium 4 which had long pipelines and complexities that cause high heat and underwhelming performance. Today the Core 2 Duo we're looking at is the E8400. This is probably one of the last iterations of the architecture design for the Core 2. This E8400 was released in January 2008. Based on the Core 2 architecture known as Wolfdale, it's a 45 nanometer node and has a TDP of 65 watts. It's clocked at 3 GHz, it has 6 MB of level 2 cache, it has a front side bus that runs at 1333 MHz and runs off a 9 times multiplier. This CPU runs off the LGA775 platform. Today's GPU we're using is a NVIDIA GT430. The GT430 was released on October 11, 2010. The GT430 is a Fermi based card. The variant of the GT430 we have today is from Asus. It's the EN GT430 forward slash DI forward slash 1GD3 in brackets LP. This card is an entry level card, so it's packed with 1 gig of DDR3 RAM. RAM's clocked effectively at 1600 MHz and runs off a 128 bit memory interface bus. Core clock runs at 700 MHz and the shader clock is at 1400 MHz. And finally, the card's TDP is 49 watts. Today's motherboard is the Gigabyte GA-G41MT-S2P. The revision of the board today we're using is version 1.3. This motherboard is an entry level class motherboard. This LGA775 board is a G41 chipset. This board supports front side buses of 800, 1066 and 1333. Also supports two DIMMs of DDR3 RAM. We'll be loading this out with 4 gig of DDR3 sticks, 2x2. Two two. The rest of the hardware today is from our standard test bench. This consists of two SSDs, one 120 gig Western Digital Green SSD and a 240 gig Western Digital Green SSD. We also have a one terabyte magnetic Western Digital Green hard drive. Now the OS we're running today is Windows 10 with build 2004. Without further ado, let's get into some fun stuff. Let's do some synthetic benchmarks and play some games. Now we're not expecting to break any records here, but it'd be interesting to see just how well the dual core can run. So first up, we're gonna look at 7-zip. So the E8400 in 7-zip, it's multi-core score, or dual core in this case, we scored 5,629 points. Putting us in last place, but everything else on this list is basically a four core or has four threads. However, the single core score is quite strong at 3,117 points. So its core strength is actually pretty strong, just doesn't have enough of them. Moving on, we've got CPU IDs, CPU Z. Our multi-score core was the lowest once again, however not lagging too far behind the Phantom 2 955 Black Edition, which is rather interesting. Our single core strengths were still pretty strong, netting us 264.2 points. This is definitely going to be interesting when we start playing games, like some of these games may run perfectly fine. Okay, we're going to move on into Cinebench. So in Cinebench, the E8400 scored us 160 points. 
So we did come last in Sydney Bench, but this is showing a multi-core score, so that's fine. We didn't do too bad. We weren't that far off from the Q8400, but we were. An overclock would be interesting to see how much we would gain in that area. This is definitely going to be interesting. Are we going to be able to run some newer titles in 2020 on this E8400? Anyway, let's move on to the video card. In Cinebench R15, the GT430 on the E8400 scored a 16.38 frames per second, putting us dead last. So, GPU-wise, we're not looking crash hot at the moment. But anyway, let's move on to the next benchmark. In Unigine Heaven, we scored 73 points. GT430 is still the slowest card, but that gap between the 6570 and the GT430 is a lot smaller. Only 11 points different. On to 3D Mark's Firestrike benchmark test, we scored 419 points at the GT430. Being a whole 300 and something points away from the HD 6570. So not looking too good here, but let's see how we go with the games. First up, we're playing in Valorant, as you can see as we went through all the other benchmarks. This is the in-game footage, and it is actually running surprisingly well. It did have a few hiccups here and there. The CPU is working its butt off there, 100% on both cores. Now we are running at 1920 by 1080 with low detail settings. Average frame rate was 48.4 frames per second. Minimum frame rate to 28.9. Maximum frame rate we hit 66.3 and our 0.1% lows were 2.1 frames per second. So, not bad, that's pretty good. Next game we moved on to was Genshin Impact. We turned the details right back on this and we ran the resolution at 1280 by 960. We tried to squeeze as much frames as we could out of this game. So this is at pretty much minimum to what I could set it to. Now the gameplay for this game, it ran alright. Now if you can handle extremely low details, running at 800 by 600, over time you get used to it. However, I didn't go into any big areas so it may actually become unplayable in some of the bigger towns and cities. Average frame rate for Genshin Impact was 26.3 frames per second. Our minimum frame rate was 16.8 frames per second and our maximum frame rate at 31.1 frames per second. The 0.1% lows, we fell to 3 frames per second. Now being the type of game it is, I think you could get away with some of these lower frame rates. However, like I said, I didn't go into the big cities, so it could become a big issue. Moving on to Heroes of the Storm. We ran this game at 1920 by 1080p on pretty much very low settings. On the whole, this game ran pretty good. It did suffer from a couple of stutters with loading, but we've seen that the Core 2 quads and it's it's going to be inherent with the Core 2 duo. Average frame rate for Heroes of the Storm was 58.9 frames per second. Minimum frame rates fell to 2.5. Maximum frame rate was at 79.8 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows were 1.6 frames per second. So it pretty much reflected how the game felt. So smooth with a few load stutters. Moving into a more spookier game title, we have Phasmophobia. Game is currently crushing it on Steam at the moment. Very popular. If you like teamwork games, this is a great one to have a look at. But if you're a little bit squirmish with horror, yeah, this will get you. Now, I was actually surprised how well this ran on a Core 2 Joe with a GT430. What's not great, we had to do a bit of trickery to get the resolution down. So we set the desktop to 800 by 600 and that set the in-game full screen to 800 by 600. We've set everything on as low as it can go, and I think if we had a little bit of a better video card, this thing actually might run quite good. Anyway, let's dive into the benchmarks. So average frame rate for Phasmophobia was 25.2 frames per second. Minimum frame rate was at 4.7 frames per second. Maximum frame rate was 42.6 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows were at 1.3 frames per second. So yes, it did have some loading, laggy sort of things going on. So the E8400 
kind of didn't really hit 100% all that often in this game. It sort of sat around between 70 and about 90%. So just depending on what you're doing. So maybe even a little overclock will even help as well. Moving into GTA 4. So we ran this at 800 by 600 at the lowest settings that we could set to. This game honestly did not run that great. It was playable. It did have issues with loading things, so it was falling behind. The CPU was getting absolutely hammered, generally sitting at 100% for the whole time. GPU follows suit, pretty much working at 98% for the whole time as well. Frame rates for GTA 4, average frame rate was 36.3 frames per second. Minimum frame rate was 8.7 frames per second. Maximum frame rate, now I'm thinking this is when it was on load screens and things like that. We had 803.5, so I'm pretty sure it wasn't rendering 3D. It was basically rendering 2D in a 3D world. Our 0.1% lows were 4.3 frames per second. So like I said before, it's playable doesn't look pretty, but I think you still have fun. Moving on to Minecraft Bedrock Edition, or better known as Minecraft Windows 10 Edition. Now, if you have a low-end PC and you want to play Minecraft, this is the edition to run. It is the most efficient version released. Now, on the Core 2 Duo, it didn't run perfect, but to be honest, it didn't run all that badly either. The CPU had to work very hard to keep up with loading all the blocks into the world. And that's probably because there's only two cores where four cores would probably be a lot better. However, it ran pretty good. We ran the graphics at 1920 by 1080 and we'd set pretty much as much details as we can to off or as low as they go. Average frame rate for Minecraft Windows 10 Edition was 28.3 frames per second. Minimum frame rate was 16.3 frames per second. Maximum frame rates hit 60.6 .6 frames per second, which would be the V-Sync, I'd say. It may have actually gone higher, but anyway, I know this game has V-Sync set. Our 0.1% low frame rate was 14.2 frames per second. Final game we're playing today is PUBG Lite. Now this game is not playable everywhere in the world. It is a free title, though if you're in a country that the game is not allowed to be played in, or a region, you can get a VPN and set it up to play in your region by punching through on a VPN. You will have to set your clock time to the actual area that your region is set for VPN, and then you should be right to go. There is a list of countries that this game is available in. So when it comes to selecting on the VPN, what country to connect to, check out that list and get yourself set up with that. Now this game ran okay. It wasn't perfect. It did have a couple of glitches here and there. Kind of usually hurt if you're in a big firefight, but it was only for a split second. And usually it was loading some game asset in. Anyway, let's jump into the benchmarks. Average frame rate for PUBG Lite was 40.8 frames per second. Minimum frame rate was 4.2 frames per second. Maximum frame rates were 54.8 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows were 3.1 frames per second. So there was the stutter from loading assets from time to time. I actually had a pretty fun game when playing this on this computer. So you can have a bit of fun with this. It is well set up for lower end computers. So this is a great game to play on this. Far from perfect, but not far from having fun. Now wrapping up today's little project, the E8400 with the GT430. Now we did choose one of the better Core 2 duos for this project. The E8400 does have six meg of cache and that makes a massive difference with its ability to perform processing. And that reflected, I think, in some of those frame rates, just able to keep up the CPU to a degree. An overclock with this would probably make a fair difference in games, and maybe that's something I might look into and make a feature video later on. Now, the Core 2 Quad is basically two of these Core 2 duos slapped into the one chip. 
So basically, we're kind of looking at half an E5450 Xeon or X5450 or the Q9650, I think it is. So all these Core 2 quads are really good Core 2 quads, and that's because they've got 6 meg of cache on each of those dies, so they have 12 meg in total. So today's system we set up for this project was more of a basic entry system or more of an office desktop with a GT430. However, with a lot of compromise and tweaking of graphics and settings, you can have a lot of fun still. You can still play 2020 titles. They won't be perfect, but you can still have a couple of giggles. So all in all, I'm actually quite impressed how well this actually did. It's also worth noting that not every title is going to work, of course. Now, there's missing instruction sets, and look, you really need four chords for some games, and that's just how it is. Just want to thank you guys all again for joining and watching this episode. Now, if you enjoyed this video, really liked this video, hit that like button. Now, if you enjoyed the content today and you want to see more of this content, please hit subscribe. Come join our lovely little community. We're all like-minded, and we love computer games and love using old systems to even play them. Now, don't be strangers, please leave a comment. This is your channel just as much as mine, so look, I love to hear what you guys have to say. You guys have given me great ideas for future videos, so please, if you got any ideas, drop them down, and I'll see if I can do anything to get those videos happen, because I do enjoy doing this for you guys. All right, that's us for the Off-Bit today. So we'll catch you guys next time on the Off-Bit.